Blumhouse's Fantasy Island. And yes, that is the title they went with. They put their name in the title. Blumhouse, the guys who have specialized in making low-budget, in some cases extremely low-budget horror movies for the better part of, uh, I think it's, they've been doing this for over a decade now, decided this was going to be their flagship. They wanted their name on this movie that not that many people ended up liking. But it was a success. Uh, but is the unedited version that they released for the home market worth the extra money? No, no, not at all. No, it's not. At all. At all. There is an elevator. In the elevator, you press the button to the floor with no name. Behind those doors, there's a life you always dreamt of. The plane, it's here. This weekend, you will be our guests. Here, anything and everything is possible. No service. It's not everything is possible. Good evening. I'm Mr. Rurik. Let me officially welcome you to Fantasy Island. So, so I finally watched this. I plan on seeing this thing theatrically, and um, when I saw it was PG-13, I just decided no. I, I don't do PG-13 horror almost ever. I, I don't like it. I think it feels censored. Uh, horror movies almost need to be rated R. There are exceptions. Tremors, The Ring. Uh, <laughs> I'm struggling to think of too many other examples, but there's a couple. Regardless... Yeah, when I found out it was PG-13, I kind of lost interest in it, but I still kind of wanted to see it. I mean, the ads were kind of interesting, and then when everybody started really talking trash about it, I got curious, and I saw it had some actors I like in it, and I personally didn't think, uh, what was that, Truth or Dare? Wasn't that the name of that movie that they did with uh, Lucy Hale and this director previously? I didn't think it was that bad. It wasn't that good, but wasn't that bad. I didn't think it was terrible. I wouldn't avoid the next movie that people worked on it. I actually kind of like Lucy Hale. first saw her in Scream 4. She had a really small part, but it was memorable. I loved her scene where um, Ghostface calls her, and he's like, you're gonna die tonight. And she, her immediate response is, oh, it's for you, and hands it to her friend. Like, that's that's kind of a funny-ass reaction. And she had a pretty good death scene. I mean, it was just a throat slit, but it was a good throat slit. And I've seen her pop up in a few things since then. I didn't watch her show. Um, she was on that thing, Pretty Little Liars. I never saw a single episode of that. I don't know anything about it. But, uh, you know, she was fine. Uh, funny that even though she's billed like she's the star of this movie, and, I mean, minute for minute, she kind of is, she's actually billed third. Well, I was surprised by that. The opening credits, because um, Maggie Q and Michael Pena are both ahead of her. Actually surprised. I think Maggie Q was billed first. And, like, who knew she had enough clout in Hollywood to demand top billing. Whatever. I mean, she had her own show for a little while, and she was in Die Hard 4. <laughs> That's about all I've seen her in. Eh, I may have seen her in something else, but I can't remember. But, uh, and, you know, Michael Pena has kind of become one of those that guy actors. He's one of those guys that just pops up in any role. He seems to just take whatever comes across his desk. I, I didn't even see him in Jexy, that god-awful movie where the guy's cell phone makes fun of him. That was embarrassing. Anyway, Fantasy Island isn't something I was especially familiar with. I, I knew the show existed, um, both versions of it. The really old one from the 70s, you know, with the plane boss, the plane, I believe, uh, Ricardo Montalban starred on it. I think that's the guy's name. And uh, then the revamp with Malcolm McDowell, which I actually had a friend who was really into, but I think that show only lasted one season. I would have forgot it even existed if not for Malcolm McDowell being in it. I love Malcolm McDowell. Who doesn't? But yeah, this this incarnation is a good idea, though. Um, each each version of Fantasy Island seems to get darker. You know, the original one, which I've heard was more or less just kind of light, fluff entertainment. Then the revamp with Malcolm McDowell was kind of uh, darker, more satirical. This one was marketed as a horror movie. Now, it's not a horror movie. It's a thriller with horror elements that were inserted during uh, reshoots. But it was marketed as a horror movie. It is a thriller. But, um, yeah, it's it's... This is another TV show. I mean, I this feels like three episodes of a TV show that have been rather half-assedly sewn together. And it would be polite to call this an ensemble. It's really just several different stories happening at once that the movie, if it had held together better, could have glued together at the end in a clever way. But because it's not... 
it just feels like you're watching a bunch of different stories that have damn near nothing to do with each other. As for the rated versus the unrated cut, um, yeah, I actually spent extra money to see this on demand so I could see the unedited version of it. I could have red boxed this thing for a dollar fifty, but I spent what seven bucks to on demand it. I should not have spent that money. Uh, there is very, very little about this movie that couldn't have been done in a PG-13. Basically, there's a tiny bit of CGI blood. There's one scene where um, that guy Jimmy O. Yang, I think that's his name, walks into a room full of bongs. And there's actually one scene where uh, Jimmy O. Yang and his brother, his brother's white, but um, he, O. Yang was adopted. Uh, they walk into this party because their fantasy is just to have one of these balls out Project X styles parties. And they walk into the party, and I initially thought that this one person was topless. I was like, hey, there's the unrated cut. No, you couldn't do that in a PG-13. And then they kind of get closer, and you realize that Jimmy O. Yang's character is gay. And this was actually um, a little skinny dude in a, like, I guess you call it a mankini, like one of those tiny little Speedos that I had just assumed it was a flat-chested woman off dancing in a corner without a top on, but it was, it was just a guy in a Speedo. But, um... Yeah, so you have those, those, them having their fantasy. You have Maggie Q, whose fantasy is that she um, didn't marry this one dude when he proposed to her. She was she decided to go for a career and regretted it ever since. And uh, she wished she had built a life, which uh, I hear is fairly common for people, is that um, that people that just decide to put their career first, they kind of look back and wish they had um, started the family. So, plausible. And the two idiot brothers just wanting to party there is no internal logic to this movie, by the way. We have no idea how these people came to this island. We have no idea how these people found out about this island. We have no idea if this island advertises on friggin' YouTube or the internet, if they just clicked on a banner ad. Was this a door-to-door -door service? How did the... How much money does this cost? Nothing... None of that is explained. Anyway, so you got Maggie Q with her fantasy about the family, the two idiot brothers, and they are idiots. They're... I guess endearingly stupid. They're they're what you'd call bros. High five, dude. We're gonna get laid. Now one of them's gay, which I guess is supposed to diminish the douchiness of them. And they're not obnoxious exactly. They're just really, they're not people you'd really want to hang out with. They're guys that you might talk to at a bar, but you would never really want to spend time with these two morons. They have them. Yeah. So that's two two groups. Then you have the guy who wishes he had served in the military. And he isn't the police, but he's a de he works a desk, and he he only you know, implies that there's a story behind why he works a desk, but he doesn't talk about it. And then Lucy Hale, and her um, fantasy is that she wishes she could get back at this girl that bullied the hell out of her, like basically forced her out of school in high school. And so you have all their little fantasies going. Um, the two brothers are just partying. Maggie Q's fantasy is pretty damn boring. It's just watching her stare lovingly at this guy and then at a little kid. That you know, they presumably they had they would have had a child, and I don't know. hers was really boring. Uh, the two brothers, I guess, that's at least kind of funny. I mean, there are some funny jokes in the two brothers, and uh, whether you're into guys or into girls, there's definitely some eye candy in that. Both there's some very fit fellas, and there's some gorgeous women in that sequence, so you get that at least. And the, except they're kind of funny. Uh, you have the the guy who wants to serve in the military. His fantasy's weird. He. he it looks like he's reliving the movie Predator almost. Like it's not there's no monster or anything, but he kinda gets abducted by this unit who are on this mission and they they think they don't believe that he's in the military, so they take him prisoner. But they're clearly not in the US, so I guess they just assume they found the one white guy posing as a soldier and it was odd. And uh then Lucy Hale's fantasy, which is like hostile, where she's just torturing this girl. And she keeps saying she thinks it's a hologram, like Tupac, like Tupac. That one time they did that concert where they did a 3D hologram of Tupac Shakur, and I think Jay-Z was rapping with him, maybe? I don't remember. But, uh, and Michael Pena runs the island with this woman who's weird. Like, she's she's got that strain nice thing, like the, the people in Get Out, just that kind of, like, forced smile. Hello, you're going to really love your fantasy. I hope you're ready for it. And there's this black, reddish black crap oozing all over the place. It's oozing out of people's orifices. <laughs> Friggin' Michael Rooker 
who I love. I love Michael Rooker. Uh, Michael Rooker, who played Yondu, the blue dude, in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and uh, Merle, the knife-handed brother of Daryl in the first few seasons of Walking Dead. He's also Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. He's done a ton of stuff. I love that actor. Deceiver is a great movie he was in that didn't get enough attention. He was in Tombstone. He had a supporting role in Tombstone. But um, he's running around the island just as like, this deranged castaway with a knife. And I'm surprised he wasn't used in the marketing more because, uh, I mean, people know who Michael Rooker is after, you know, he's, he's had some major hits lately. I'm, I'm kind of surprised they didn't push him harder. But, yeah, uh, so there's a lot of weird stuff going on this island, and it does kind of feel like this half-assed, lost wannabe. Like I said, this feels like it was conceived as a TV show then somehow repackaged into a movie, especially at the end of the movie, because the end of the movie, you, you feel like you've watched the pilot to a TV show. They are hoping to franchise this hard, and I would... There might be a sequel. There could be a sequel. This movie made money, but not that many people liked it. Um, maybe a straight-to-video sequel, or straight-to-DVD, straight-to-VOD sequel would be most likely, or maybe a straight-to-Netflix sequel. I could see that, or Hulu. I think Bloomhouse works with Hulu, not Netflix, so if anything, it would probably be straight-to-Hulu. But yeah, it's, it's just... The acting is middling to okay to not quite okay. No one's at the top of their game here. You know, Michael Rooker, I've seen him be better in other movies. I think that this thing was shot very quickly and without a lot of care. Michael Pena has definitely been better in other movies. Maggie Q's actually good in it. Like I said, her, her storyline's pretty boring, but her performance is good. Lucy Hale's entertaining. She's playing this kind of dumb, ditzy girl uh, when she's introduced... Well, not when she's introduced, but the first real dialogue sequence she has, she's walking around with two drinks. She's like, oh, I'm two fists in it. And then she she immediately starts hitting on this guy, the, the, the dude who wishes he was a soldier. I mean, like straight up, hey, you want to see my room type stuff? It's like mm. <laughs> a little aggressive, but attractive girl. Many guys would probably say yes to that. This guy doesn't. You know, and Michael Pena, he's... I think the problem with him is that he wasn't really sure throughout the whole movie if he was playing a hero or, or a villain. And it, it felt like the actor was unclear on how to play this role. Because I think Michael Pena probably could have done a better job in this part if he had had more direction. But then again, this part also feels like maybe it should have been played by an actor with more presence. Michael Pena is a character actor. He's a straight-up character actor. He is not a leading man. That's not an insult. Character actors are great. They support. And like, I mean, he's been fantastic and stuff. He was great in Observe and Report, that Seth Rogen movie. He was great in Crash. That was the movie that made him a star. So, I like him. It's just that this... Uh, one way or the other, he's not quite landing. And it's, he's kind of the linchpin. I mean, if, if they did get their franchise out of this, which I doubt, but if they do, he would be the guy that would be in all the movies. Just inevitably, it's his island. And he's just not that strong of a character. I'm not, I'm not going to remember him later. Uh, you know, get um, Mike Vogel and Kim Coates, who were both in TV shows I liked. Uh, Mike Vogel was on that show Under the Dome. He was also in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake in Cloverfield. I like the actor a lot. But he plays uh, one of the soldiers that the dude who wishes he could be a soldier encounters. And Kim Coates plays a Eastern European terrorist in a purge mask running around shooting up the two idiot brothers' fantasy. That happens. <laughs> It's kind of hard to explain, but yeah, and um, there's a lot of dumb crap in this movie. I got it. I want it. I got it. I'm your friend. I've always wanted to hear you say that. But I can't completely trash this movie, and the reason I can't is I saw this not too long after I saw the Guy Ritchie movie, The Gentleman, that Matthew McConaughey British gangster movie. And one thing I noticed with both The Gentleman, which is a way better movie than this. And, and uh, Fantasy Island is that they're both kind of, there's a little bit of a return to narrative happening, where they're paying more attention to character, to story, to emotional beats, which I like. I miss that. Um, so many movies now are so thin. They're just kind of in one ear and out the other, and you kind of feel like you didn't go anywhere with the movie. It was just as, as basic as it could be. And this movie, Fantasy Island is an ambitious movie. I mean, there's a lot happening here. There's a lot of story. There's a lot of ideas. The fact that it's not especially well executed doesn't diminish the fact that they tried. I feel like they were trying to do something interesting. If it didn't work, it didn't work, and whatever, you know, not, not everything lands, and... I, I didn't hate this movie. Some people, I feel like, are trashing it so hard because it's become kind of fashionable to hate Blumhouse, and I kind of don't blame them. I mean, Blumhouse has had more failures than hits at this point. 
uh, in terms of quality, not in terms of financials. I think that all of their movies basically have been financially successful because they spend nothing on their movies. Even that god awful Black Christmas movie was like was probably financially successful. I mean, I think it had a budget of like two million dollars. Yeah. So um, the the unratedness or the unedited version it's very very mild. You see a knife go through a guy's chest for like two seconds. There's blood on some bullet heads, which is clear, clearly CGI. So in a PG thirteen movie, they would just you just see the hit and they fall. In the unedited version, you see a little bit of blood splatter. That's obvious CGI, and then they fall. Uh, the scene with the pot. Um, there's basically it's nothing. This movie was not shot for an R. I guarantee it. If anything, it was shot to go either way. But I do not think this movie was shot for an R. I think that this was a marketing gimmick because they found out that people were disappointed when it was PG-13. I remember that being in several reviews, like this should have been an R. And I would have seen it theatrically if it had been an R. So, and I probably I may not have bothered seeing it if it. Had if not for the unrated cut on the the, the 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 disc, if I had been tricked, I was tricked, into thinking that there would be more to it. Yeah. So, that's it. Uh, spoilers from here on out. So, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. This is why the movie doesn't make sense. So, oh, uh, there, were, there were heavy reshoots to turn this into a horror movie, because this is a Blumhouse movie, and it was shot as a thriller, and it was retrofitted into being a horror movie. Lee Wannell... Dude who did, um, he wrote, um, he wrote the first few Insidious movies and he directed the last one or two, directed, wrote and directed The Invisible Man, wrote and directed Upgrade, uh, wrote the first four Saw movies. He, uh, he apparently was brought in to consult because he was working on The Invisible Man around the same time this was being done to kind of up the horror. And you can see where the horror stuff was kind of inserted. Like there's this random torture scene with Kim Coates character where he's torturing one of the two idiot brothers. Uh, there's, um this burnt figure that keeps appearing on these little, really cheap jump scares that are just stupid. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, there's this evil doctor guy, how do they call it? Dr. Torture that Lucy Hale is, it's some sort of projection of Lucy Hale's past. This guy, this buff ass guy in OR scrubs with his mouth stapled shut that shows up to enact, enact her torture fantasy on her childhood bully. And even though Lucy Hale's plotline is the most uh, entertaining of all of them, it is also the one that breaks the movie. Because when you find out Lucy Hale is this movie's villain, yeah, she's the villain. It makes no sense. None. Um, you know, like, if you look at a great twist, like The Sixth Sense, they were very careful that if you go back and rewatch that movie, everything makes sense, you know. He didn't talk to his wife, not because they were fighting and they just weren't speaking, but because she he was he was dead. He did never um, interact directly with the boy's mother, not because the director didn't think it was important to show it, but because he was dead. You know, all this stuff, he doesn't, even the where he sits down at the table with his wife, the chair is already partially pulled out, so he doesn't touch the chair to move it. He is able to just sit down. So the wife's not like, hey, how'd that chair just move? You know, it was barely, and I mean, The Sixth Sense is probably one of the best, if not, well, it is one of the best, if not the best twist ending of all time. But a good twist ending needs to hold up to rewatching, and her twist that she was actually orchestrating all this doesn't make a damn bit of sense. To, to under, for that to work, she has been play acting for an audience of one herself through the whole movie. Because there's numerous scenes where she is by herself and she seems scared, she seems confused, she seems concerned for other people's safety. Then at the end of the movie, she's like, oh, I was the villain. I wanted you all to be tortured and killed. I was in control all the time. You were in a room alone, by yourself, acting for no for the benefit of no one. That Oh my God, this is real. They're actually torturing her. This isn't a hologram. And she's supposed to be this, like, crazy wallflower that never got any attention. A, she's very pretty. I don't buy that she never got any attention. But she's supposed to be this crazy wallflower that never got any attention. Kind of like Carrie. And um, so she had one date with this one guy, and then he died because of alternately negligence. Well, basically, or inaction. Negligence or inaction from all these other people. The, the two brothers were his roommates, and they didn't warn him about the fire that kills him. Uh, Maggie Q's character accidentally started the fire, um, and then the the guy who wishes he was a soldier was actually a cop. Man, he was a pussy, and he wouldn't go into the burning building to save the guy. So that, that's why she's mad at all of them, and she set all this up. But it 
just doesn't make any sense. And also, why does she try and seduce this guy right away? Like, she comes on to him hardcore. The first, she doesn't know. He could easily have gone for that. Then she, she's going to what? She's going to bang the guy that she blamed for killing the love of her life, although it is kind of funny that the love of her life, she, she literally went on one date with him, and she has him as the background on her cell phone. And when Jimmy O. Yang, who is pretty funny in this movie, sees that, he's like, holy shit, they went on one date. Like That is that is class A stalker. Like That is a girl... Like I was on a date with a girl one time, and she told me she loved me on the first date, and I, I like, went, immediately went to my brother and was like, this, that's bad, right? And he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, she's nuts. She plays the role well. She's fun. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Apparently, they weren't even sure that she was going to be the villain. I don't know if that was necessarily a reshoot, but it was being worked out during production as to whether or not she or the female assistant to Michael Pena is going to be the villain. And it was decided that she would be, and it doesn't make any sense. It's really stupid. But I don't know. The movie overstates its welcome. It's it's close to two hours. It doesn't need to be the, the plot lines don't connect very well we spend so much time on when people say this should have been an r rating what they mean is this should have gone for it and it doesn't go for it because it was never supposed to be an r rating they edited this to pretend it was an r rating this was a tv show and this was a tv show they probably were pitching to either sci-fi abc or fox possibly showtime but i doubt it and it didn't get picked up so they somehow glued all the these like the first few episodes together into this movie, and it just, it's in a mess. It's an interesting mess. It's an ambitious mess. It's not an awful movie, but it's not a good movie. And uh, as far as paying extra money for the unrated cut, damn that. This this is not worth, yeah, just watch the PG-13 if you got to watch it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not as bad as people make it out to be, but that don't make it good. Fantasy Island!